Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk on Flink performance. My name is Brent Davis. Uh, I'm a principal performance engineer at Splunk, and I work on the Splunk performance scalability and reliability team. So we're a team that's focused on, on a number of Splunk products, but today I'm going to talk about our streaming product and the kind of journey we've been on over the last year plus to scale our streaming product, which really has Flink at its center, to some really extremely high scale Flink jobs, 20 gigabyte per second or more in some cases, which is equivalent to about 1.7 petabyte per day, all this in a single Flink job. So this is the agenda. We're gonna talk about the environment of performance testing in general, um, the basic challenges of, of a streaming job of this size, uh, we're going to dig into some of the optimizations and challenges and sources, uh, functions and syncs, and then putting it all together in terms of the, the final results uh, we got with this, with this scale. So first, to get this kind of scale requires a lot of hardware. Uh, this is the environment we built up in the Google Cloud Platform using N1 standard 32 VMs and over 200 of these in a single Kubernetes cluster running Flink test managers and parallelism across many thousands of tasks in a single job. So to talk about the, the Splunk streaming engine, this product uh, that, that runs on Flink, this collects, processes, delivers data to Splunk and to other destinations. Uh, you can use a myriad of data sources. Splunk can do filtering, aggregation, enrichment, lookups, masking fields, all kinds of operations on top of that data, which is really on top of the, the Flink uh, software platform. And then we send it to any number of destinations, Splunk, uh, Enterprise, S3, Splunk Observability, uh, any number of, of, of syncs there. So one key thing we did here with the scaling jobs is to, uh, is to separate ingest and processing. Uh, we use Apache Pulsar as our replayable data source. If you're not familiar with Pulsar, it's sort of a next generation pub sub system, a, a lot like Kafka, but with uh, some definite scalability advantages. And what this did is allow us to queue up data on Pulsar and then off we go to Flink for processing. And to test this kind of scale really requires us to be methodical about our approach. Um, we use this open source Splunk project event gen uh, that we rewrote in Golang for, for some performance advantages, but this was our data generation platform. And that's, this really allows us to control the cardinality and shape of our data. Uh, it's just really important for getting proper results around performance, you know, stateful operations, aggregation, and so forth in, in Flink. Uh, the middle box, this is really the Splunk streaming engine. Um, all of these things we just talked about in the previous slide, all built into a Kubernetes cluster, uh, everything exposed in Prometheus metrics. We pulled basically everything we could into a Splunk index for performance analysis, uh, metrics and logs out of Flink. Uh, Kubernetes, our code itself, all this into a Splunk index that could give us a single pane of glass, kind of looking at all these different um, hosts and metrics across the, uh, a large large variety of parallelism. And then adding in uh, profiling tools, um, the one we ended up relying on the most, it's really nice, uh, very simple to run, is async profiler, which uses an async API in the in the JVM itself to get stacks and flame graphs from from the JVM around CPU, memory, and, and lock graphs. Okay, so first let's just dive into the Flink architecture in general. Um, just we we'll cover some basics and, and lay some groundwork. Um, so basics here, uh, what the Splunk stream engine does is turn Splunk's proprietary language, SPL, into programs on Flink, just in a nutshell. Um, so this chart should look really, really familiar. Um, it's a really common thing to do in streaming. We, uh, we support lots of sources and syncs, um, but in our particular use case for scaling I'm gonna talk about today, we're really taking um, a number of logs containing rich information about um, monitoring, tracing, uh, and, and, and reading these from the Pulsar source doing an, a number of complex aggregations, filtering, masking functions, compute metric time series on, on these events, and then writing through a sync, in this case, uh, 20 gigabyte per second, sending it uh, mostly to either a Splunk Enterprise index cluster or to the Splunk Observability Cloud. So that's kind of the one slot single parallelism view. 
this is really what it looks like in terms of the Flink job graph. Uh, this picture is straight out of the, the Flink documentation, so it should look pretty familiar. Um, essentially, we're creating a DAG of operations that need to get executed in some order to compute something. So there's a source, a map, a key by, a window, and a sync. And so digging into this a little bit, you know, the dotted boxes are tasks, the yellow circles are operators, and um, you can see Flink does a pretty simple optimization right off the bat. Uh, if you write a program that has a whole bunch of operators and they don't require any sort of data partitioning in order to execute them, so you're not doing any sort of grouping by key, um, Flink will do what's called chaining and chain potentially a whole bunch of operators together into a single task. And that single task is executed in a, in a thread. Um, and then we're, this is separated by things that actually require trips over the network or between, um, between processes. These X's are, are, are is essentially a data repartitioning. So you know, group by or rescale, or chain and parallelism, these kind of things require this operation, which we call a shuffle. Uh, so bear with me, uh, folks, for, for anyone who's, this is a review, we'll get deeper in a minute, but just kind of laying the groundwork here. Okay, so when you run this job graph on Flink, you, you specify a particular parallelism. In this case, it's simply two. Uh, as I said, we have jobs at Splunk that run in the many thousands of threads. Um, but see here, the parallelism is two throughout the graph. It scales down to parallelism of one at the sink. So we can, we can change parallelism at, at any point here. Uh, notice that because this has a key by or repartitioning, this X in the middle, this is uh, full streaming repartitioning of the data. Now, um, imagine if instead of two threads, you're doing this with a parallelism of 1,000 or, or 7,000. So you've got this massive combination of uh, end by end network channels between operators, and that can get pretty complicated. So we'll talk about this a little bit later on. So that's really the first piece of background I wanted to discuss. Uh, the second is here was around managing state. So if we consider the job graph we were just discussing, we did this, this window over some key and uh, kind of grouped together into n number of task managers. Now, if you're computing something like an aggregate or a count, we have to guarantee that even after a failure that we're able to get the right count. And Flink's answer to this is checkpoints. So checkpoints, um, really checkpoints are just a consistent snapshot of the distributed data stream at any point um, in the operator state. So what does this mean? I mean, really what we want from a checkpoint is the ability to recover from any failure correctly with the correct data. So, you know, the naive thing to do here would be uh, across all this parallelism, stop everything, take a snapshot. But we don't want to stop the world, um, so we use this asynchronous distributed snapshot algorithm. And uh, really, the, the way this works is we insert this thing called a checkpoint barrier into the data flow at every source, and it flows through the graph. So this ensures the consistency of the, of the checkpoint. And um, you know, we, one of these checkpoint barriers will arrive at the operator first, and that operator will begin buffering the data it's reading while waiting for other checkpoint barriers to arrive. And um, let see this begin to happen in the uh, alignment phase. And eventually the last barrier will arrive and the checkpoint can go ahead. So the, the sort of time in between the first checkpoint barrier arriving at an operator and the last is called the checkpoint alignment time. And uh, we'll get into more detail on, on tuning this in a second. So now for some real world examples. Uh, this is what we really don't want to happen. <laughs> In, in my scenario here with lots of parallelism, in this case over 3000, things aren't looking so good. Uh, we have multiple shuffles and high parallelism and we have this, this alignment I just talked about happening across all input channels. Uh, we've got to do these alignments across all those shuffles and every, every task in the graph. And uh, we can see you know, things are not looking good. I've got a checkpoint time out of 10 minutes set. Uh, over this short period of time, each checkpoint is taking longer and longer, four minutes, five minutes, six minutes, etc. And eventually times out never to complete again. 
Um, so we're going to talk about the various complexities of this problem along with uh, several other optimizations along the way. But, um, but understanding of this and, 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 and working around this is key to understand how we deal with, with sources in particular. Um, so, so with these kind of basic concepts described, let's talk about sources. Um, I mean, really, what what all everything we talked about to this point is really laying the groundwork for talking about skew. And if our source is creating skew, then we're in for a world of hurt. Um, so, what happens with a skewed source? I mean, what could happen? Uh, that there's there's back pressure on some input channels. Some are back pressured and some are not. And then we get this large skew between when various checkpoint bar barriers hit the same task. And I might have to potentially buffer a lot of data during that, that alignment period. And then there's a second consequence um, downstream that, uh, that we could, this imbalance load on various operators uh, computationally, we, if we max out CPU or we have higher DC time than some task managers and others, then we get back pressure. Uh, even more back pressure uh, down the down the down the pipeline down the job, and we make the whole skew problem even even worse. So this is what's known uh, colloquially as a death spiral, which um, we got familiar with in our testing. Um, so that's really the, the kind of the crux here. With this massive parallelism, managing the skew becomes super important. And. Uh, and where do these skews come from? I mean, just mentioned these, you know, so say there's back pressure in the system. So it's taking a long time for barriers to go through the system, or there's some sort of non-uniform key distribution coming from the source. So that's going to create problems as well. Uh, but, but one thing we know for sure is that the greater the skew, the more buffered state will have to carry as those alignment times widen. And my discussion around sources is really around minimizing skew. That's um, really the job of a source, to read data and try to get it evenly into our, our job pipeline. Um, so this first parameter here is pretty easy and important, um, is how the Flink scheduler allocates slots. And uh, if, this, if this isn't set, this cluster evenly spread out slots, uh, the Flink scheduler will fill available slots in one JVM, one task manager before moving to the next. So you can imagine we have six slots available and a job of parallelism of four, when it, with this, um, without this set, we could have three slots uh, end up on one JVM and one in another. Um, not necessarily a problem, but any sort of resource pressure on that first JVM, we could have data flowing slightly slower, and that is what we don't want. Um, so definitely that's something kind of first pass we need to fix on our testing. Um, this next parameter is a little bit different. It's in, in terms of key group distribution. So while the previous parameter had to do with assigning parallelism to a JVM, this parameter really has to do with how we partition our data stream and operate on it. Um, and, and the way this is done is that a stream is divided into key groups and given to an operator to work on. Uh, and if an operator receives one key group and another receives two, the second uh, thread will have uh, likely twice as much work to do. So um, the number of key groups is determined by max parallelism, and the number of operators is determined by parallelism. So uh, max parallelism is used in computing key groups and key group assignments, and it's important to determining which subtasks really receive the data. Um, so looking at the code snippet here, you see how the code group, how the key groups are created, um, and the problem, you know, the way this problem manifests is if, if we're looking at say the job manager UI, you see some subtasks receiving many more records than others. Uh, it's, it's simply because this formula here that um, computes key groups, uh, it rounds to an int and we have this mix of different threads getting different amounts of data uh, because they have different uh, number of key groups assigned to them. So what does this really mean practically? Um, really this max parallelism parameter is what's important here. Um, in, in reality, we just set it to a really large number to have a large key space. Um, does have a little bit of cost error, but more generically, we want a, a highly composite number with a lot of factors. Is, is, that's a good number for this, and mostly just don't don't set it too low. Okay, um, so basically, other sources um, we didn't 
test Kinesis and S3 uh, sources really at high volume for this project, but for complete li completeness, um, just how other sources manage this problem. Uh, for example, the Kinesis source uses a global watermark manager on the job manager. So this helps to reduce the, um, the alignment time inside the source itself, and stop reading from some partitions if they get ahead. Uh, so I haven't stressed this to this, but it, it might be a good model for uh, uh, to make a pipeline that is more resilient to skew. Uh, the S3 source of Flink 112, I understand, also has some code to help reduce skew. Um, and in the Pulsar Kafka situation, uh, we want to keep the keys distributed. You know, if we partition our data well on Pulsar, that sure helps everything downstream. Okay, so that's sources. Um, what about operators or functions that do computation on, on the stream? So the, kind of the first thing in building performant functions, as we mentioned before, you know, we have these, these shuffles in this diagram, we have these X's that are representing them. And what that means is that there's network and deserialization costs every time we do a shuffle, serialization, deserialization. So I mean, shuffles are really unavoidable um, if you're doing, uh, any kind of key by. And if you're doing a number of operations that require shuffle, uh, as we mentioned before, this means you can't do the task chaining optimization uh, where Flink combines multiple, multiple operators. So in order to do these operations uh, that have a, uh, in, in this example, we have to do a key by on each of them. You have to do shuffle after shuffle after shuffle, even though we, we, we are shuffling on the same key. And, and this gets expensive. Um, however, so if you can, and this is a big if, uh, if you can guarantee the stream needs to, a stream that needs to be partitioned is partitioned exactly the same way, uh, you can skip the shuffle uh, using this reinterpreted reinterpret as keyed stream. Um, so you can see here uh, this uh, this is kind of performance we got with that shuffle across multiple uh, operators, and using reinterpret as keyed stream allows us to eliminate those shuffles. Um, and uh, it makes a pretty large difference in the throughput. You know, you know, as the more shuffling you have to do because of high parallelism, the more avoiding shuffling helps. Um, so this definitely, uh, your mileage may vary, but this is uh, um, certainly something that that's, can be really helpful. Um, just be aware of this warning. Uh, you know, the, the, that the um, stream that needs to be repartitioned has to be exactly as Flink would have re, would have partitioned it if it had done a shuffle. Um, so the, um, the, uh, the next step here is, uh, is enable object reuse. This is the next setting, um, I wanted to talk about, um, enable object reuse allows Flink to reuse stream objects between operators for better performance. So just in terms of throughput, you know, our pipeline, in our pipeline, this improved throughput by about 20%. Uh, there's also downstream improvements by reducing object allocation. We improve uh, GC times, and that's proved really critical. Um, so, what does this mean? Enable object reuse basically means you can you, you allows you to modify an output object and emit it again. Um, your code needs to be aware this is happening, so don't turn it on just willy nilly. Um, but uh, and it applies really, you know, if you think about it, it really only applies to situations where data is forwarded between operator instances in the same task. So in sort of a chaining situation. So it really kind of depends on the shape of your job, but you know, creating less objects is generally gonna be a good thing. Um, so that's that's sort of our impacts of using enable object reuse. Um, next, let's talk about um, serialization and deserialization. So nearly any Flink job will need to send records to a separate process or JVM and therefore, these records need to be serialized into bytes for that for that shuffle to occur across the processes. So uh, the compute cost of serialization is likely to be quite high. I mean, it's, it's generally going to show up in your flame graphs if you're profiling, and especially with jobs with, with numerous shuffles. So um, a couple of things here. Uh, if you're working with Flink tuple types, you can simply specify a position of the field that we use as a key. And, um, and this, this tuple type will remove a lot of overhead if you can take advantage of that. 
But really, um, just, just take a look at the serialization code, what it's doing, particularly in terms of object allocation. We had some cases where we could uh, eliminate Avro deep copies, um, where, point where we were serializing the JSON, the Jackson uh, object mapper we could cache and, and improve object allocations. Um, uh, the Kairos serializer, serializer is uh, much, much slower and the fallback serializer so generally, it's probably a mistake if you're tuning for throughput. So if you see that in your basic flame graphs, that might be a great place to, to write a new, a new serializer for that. Uh, this is a really deep topic. Uh, there's a great article by Nico Kruber on this subject. So I, I put a link in the slides. Highly recommend anyone interested in, in tuning performance in this subject uh, to take a look at that, that article and the, and the nice benchmarks he has there. Um, okay, and just some other best practices here. Uh, another way to avoid skewed data is just to make sure all the data in your stream is valid. Um, don't have anything in there that could be throwing off your keys. We ran into that situation a couple times. Um, avoid back pressure in the pipeline by um, scaling to higher parallelism for those expensive compute operators um, so that we, we, they can handle it without back pressure. Um, of course, whenever we change parallelism, we incur shuffle costs. And then um, lastly, pre-aggregating before shuffling records can, can certainly reduce the overhead. So let's move on to sinks. Um, so the first uh, obvious thing, um, writing to a persistent backend store is that uh, we don't wanna do a round trip for each record, that's, that's obvious. Uh, so we need batching. We tried several imp implementations of batching in our sync. Uh, the first implementation was using the process window function, and with this implementation, the batch function itself turned out to be a bit of a bottleneck in our job, uh, so we went hunting for another solution. Um, the second, second try, uh, we do this key by and process steps to essentially replicate batching behavior and collect events into a collection, um, and that did give us uh, an improvement, um, but we actually had this third implementation, which used um, connected streams. So uh, this, 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 this put this timer in a, in a source function that generates heartbeats at regular intervals and then connect that to the event stream. Uh, when the heartbeat occurs, the data is flushed and then the, um, and, and the co-process function can handle handles the incoming events. Um, so as you can see, we got um, almost three times performance out of, out of that implementation. Uh, it turns out to be really key in getting our getting batching right in our product. Okay, um, next topic in syncs is async IO. Um, and I don't think I need to convince anyone that asynchronous IO is a good thing for throughput performance. Um, it allows us to handle many requests concurrently and then receive the responses concurrently. Uh, definitely without async IO, the communication delay with the external system can dominate the total work of the, of the, of the job. Uh, certainly that held true in our system, in our testing, moving to async API, async IO API improved the total sync performance significantly here. But uh, perhaps we went a little overboard. Um, this was a setting we had at one point, huge batches and huge async capacity, basically meaning in-flight requests. So on this, Per JVM level, we'd, we'd start a job. We have this huge spike we started it. The buffer's filled with, with massive throughput, and you can see the spike here. But pretty soon, the job is slow to nothing, and eventually, we get this timeout exception on the async wait operator. Um, so what's happening here is that uh, we'd end up overwhelming the persistent storage, a Splunk indexer in this case, on the other side of the sink. Uh, you know, just with such high size of in-flight requests, the indexer was not able to exert back pressure on the rest of the pipeline. And as a result, we, we just ran into this, this, these async wait operator timeouts and then the pipeline will restart. So um, uh, with async capacity lower, not so many in-flight requests where back pressure can be exerted through the indexer, you know, even though the indexer would receive more data than it could index that back pressure on the right of the pipeline would cause the throughput to be stable and um, pipeline stabilized set of throughput that the indexer could, could sustain. 
Um, so lesson here, you know, async IO is great, but we really need to consider the throughput of the store on the other side of the sink to, to kind of to tune it well. Um, and also, actually, um, one other thing in the, in the very first slide we showed this is to reduce the parallelism before the sink uh, can also help to keep from overwhelming the, the, the backend store with connections and data from these, these massively parallel jobs. Okay, so uh, putting this, all this together, um, just looking at our performance of, of the job overall end to end, um, we definitely needed a lot of memory. These large sort of medium duration objects, these aggregations in the heap, uh, lots of memory is necessary, uh, but also watching parallelism on a per test manager basis so that we don't completely overwhelm garbage collection uh, as, 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 uh, as a bottleneck. Uh, profiling and tuning object allocations became really important to us because just of how much time we were spending in, in garbage collection. Um, async profiler has some, some really nice object allocation flame graphs that were helpful here, uh, so just so that GC itself doesn't become the thing that's slowing us down. And, um, and for our, our case, we're really a lot more concerned with throughput than with latency. Uh, for throughput, really uh, recommend the parallel garbage collection collector. Uh, this is in Java 1.8, um, but I played around with the G1DC garbage collector to in different regions. It's um, it just it isn't isn't ready for this in 1.8. Uh, things got uh, we got better throughput overall with a parallel collector. Parallel collector, it's a lot simpler, um, but I tuned it very aggressively. So. Um, if we're going to do GC, use all this vCPU we can on the machine and allow it to take a bit of time to do that and then just kind of let it go. Um, so between tuning the object allocations and, and GC tuning, that really helped our overall job stability. Uh, next, uh, overall, avoid back pressure. Um, we talked about back pressure a bit already. Um, under back pressure, those checkpoint barriers that we talked about, they propagate slowly. And uh, actually, I mean, if everything's under heavy back pressure, but it stays aligned and the checkpoint barriers all kind of arrive at the same time, there's not, there's not so much of an issue. Uh, but that's a pretty big if. And in practice, it just seems like whenever we have back pressure, things tend to get out of alignment. We see skew and, and things get, get wonky. Um, so we just really want to avoid that long end-to-end -end checkpoint alignment duration. Uh, and uh, avoid back pressure, especially in operators that could cause an imbalance is uh, really key. So to avoid back pressure, you, know, you, you could rate limit at the source or limit parallelism at the source. In our case, let Pulsar absorb spikes if we're having higher incoming requests than we can handle. And as I mentioned, those costly operators just scale up parallelism so that they don't become the choke point. Um, and this is another thing that can help back pressure. Uh, the uh, network buffers and credit-based flow control system in Flink is, is really cool. I, I recommend uh, reading up on that. Uh, I'm not going to cover it here in too much depth, but basically we ended up using a lot of network buffers. You know, might waste a a little memory, but but two little network buffers creates a situation where you can have periods of activity that just create more skew. Uh, one interesting piece here is that there's this, this output flusher thread that's designed for situations where data is on the on the buffer network buffer for too long and it increases the latency. In our high volume scenario, that flush mechanism created more problems than it was worth sometimes. So we saw this output flusher thread consume a lot of CPU in our flame graphs. Uh, so that's just something to watch for. That output flusher thread running very aggressively may not be uh, what you want, depending on your use case, and, um, and maybe not all that necessary in a high volume, well-balanced load. And lastly, this, this Linux native ePoll um, setting for NetE transport, uh, it's just setting you can tweak um, using that in the network, network layer, re it reduces the crossover between user and kernel space, um, which is costly and, and showed a nice benefit for us. All right, so if we've done everything right, uh, this is the picture we have at the end. We, if we, we've avoided skew, we've managed our, our garbage collection, we've avoided back pressure, and unlike the screenshot I showed earlier, 
with ever increasing and eventually failing checkpoints. Here we see our checkpoint times are 20 seconds or so. You know, they're not increasing over time across the a high parallelism. Um, so this is where we want to be. You know, this is a result of, of, of a lot of the tuning uh, that we discussed to get us here. But the, uh, the story isn't quite over. Uh, a checkpoint doesn't do you any good if you can't recover. Um, you know, this is, this is where a, a large, large checkpoint size could hurt restore recovery times, you know, even though you might align quickly and the checkpoint time itself doesn't take a lot of time. For the checkpoint to restore itself can take a lot of time as you pull it back over persistent storage. So that's kind of the, 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 the first piece to be aware of in terms of restore recovery time. Uh, but really, what I want to talk about is a second piece where once a checkpoint file is restored, you could very well create a lot of back pressure. Um, so high back pressure under recovery can cause plenty of its own issues. And you know, all the issues we talked about with back pressure apply if we restore a checkpoint, start recovering an even higher throughput to catch up uh, on backlog in our job. Uh, and careful task manager sizing. Uh, can help here, making sure we have the right parallelism that our job can handle all the way through. Because, uh, you know, we don't want to develop skew on checkpoint recovery either. Um, so testing checkpoint uh, recovery uh, is, uh, you know, de definitely something that, uh, that we found really important. And this is kind of an interesting case. Uh, this is actually a bug in our own software uh, that we discovered by testing a checkpoint recovery. Um, so I'll just I'll just step through this. Um, now this is basically a, a bug uh, mixing time domains. So I, again, definitely do not recommend you do this. This is just kind of interesting to show show the mechanics here. Um, so um, background really in order to do in order to do time based computations on a window like any kind of aggregation on the data stream. You know, you use a clock that's extracted from the data. This is this is what we call event time. But there's also processing time, which is not extracted from the data, and we can think of kind of as wall clock time. So the problem here that we found in, in recovery is that we're setting the window based on processing time, but extending the window based on event time and some and some grace period, and ending up with windows that stay open far longer than they should. And because of this difference between wall clock time and the data that's being that's being recovered. So we see you know lots of events coming in in the processing window after a restore state. Um, then uh, we have uh, uh, windows that continue to extend as uh, over the over the over the grace period over the time period and um, all the process all the events can't be processed in the window and then you know maybe we have some multi-second uh, GC pauses so that, that doesn't help anything. Um, then we have lots of windows created due to uh, the, the, you know this high influx of, of restored events that are right around the current processing time. And then lots of windows. So we have lots of windows, uh, long windows that are expanding and, uh, and, and, and things go haywire. Um, so the lesson here really is uh, you know, well, first of all, don't mix time domains. That's a recipe for all kinds of strange behavior. Uh, but really, you know, having checkpoints is nice, uh, but we really need to test the behavior under recovery. Um, and it's not something we want to deal with under the pressure of a real life, real life recovery restore. So um, lastly, just some things around testing for performance in this whole endeavor. Um, you know, just key point, key points, you know, a Flink system can perform very differently under spiky loads of back pressure and, re and recovery. Uh, so we need to be able to quantify the behavior under all those situations. Um, we learned a lot from just tuning under low parallelism and a few slots and micro benchmarks, but some lessons also need scale. Some of these lessons just required some really high scale tests. Um, you know, take a look at the um, back pressure metrics that Flink provides. Um, this is really helpful to find hot spots in our in our jobs, and and observing these metrics, you know, this gives us gives us that ability, especially if there's issues that might create skew there. You know, another another thing here is the you know, metrics and logging system uh, is really necessary at this scale of jobs. So. Um, Many of the problems you're looking at performance across all these task managers, it's really important to have something like Splunk in the background 
to uh, collect all these metrics and logs together so we could have a single pane of glass to kind of look at the performance of our overall Flink system. Um, and, and really, really key, um, all this tuning, uh, we need to do this with a realistic data set. You know, when, when aggregating, you have to have the correct cardinality. And this is where our time invested in generating realistic data load, um, high realistic data load at the start became really important. And lastly, you know, it seems obvious, but we need really high parallelism for this kind of throughput. And the trade-off is that kind of risk for skew. So we covered a lot of ground here. I, I hope it was useful. Um, I want to send out acknowledgments to lots of other smart and creative engineers at Splunk. This isn't all my work. Lots of colleagues, blood, sweat, and tears went into this. Um, we are hiring, so if you find this kind of work compelling, you know, please get in touch. And uh, lastly, just a big thank you to Verica for asking me to speak and for putting on this, this really enjoyable link conference. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.